Because I'm the director of the Texas Language Center. Uh, uh, a professor, an associate professor of Slavic and Eurasian studies. Um, this is terrific. This is beginning now. We're in our starting into our sixth year now at the Texas Language Center. Welcome to the first event of the spring season. And fall. Oh, fall. Fall. I'm, I'm just thinking yeah, about I projected. I projected. Let it in. Let it in. I, I yeah. accept your invitation for being the first speaker in the of, of the spring. <laughs> I keep, I keep channeling frozen, let it go, let it go. <laughs> okay, yes, it is just the fall, isn't it? But this is terrific because we started, we really wanted to start the fall with a bang. And I don't think we could have done better. So let me, let me get, let's get right to the, to the main event. First of all, you should have in your seat, this is our, our new fall newsletter that kind of wraps up both what we did last spring as well as things that are upcoming for this uh, this this fall. That's there the is, old. That's the old one. And, oh, I'm holding up <laughs> there is a, a there is a, a new one. one. There's a new one coming. Yes, there it is. You guys have. Yes, it. they have it. You they have both. I've got the old. There's a new one and an old one. Uh, and the, you should also have a pink sheet which has our current event schedule. Texas Language Center. We're very very pleased that for the time we continue to receive support from our uh, dean of liberal arts. We make all of our event, events open to the public. We, for big workshops that we do on weekends, there's a very nominal fee, and the fee covers all of your materials, as well as a terrific lunch provided by Betsy. She cooks it herself. <laughs> uh, so, so check us out online. Literally, our, 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 for graduate students in particular, it's next to free. I think I'm trying to remember what, the, what is it? Five bucks. It's five bucks for grad students. That includes your lunch and everything else. Come on. You're Coffee making money tea. on that deal. You're making money. <laughs> so join us at our events. We really love the fact that we are a UT public education institution. We are open like our Coral uh, Center. We are all open educational resources. Everything we do is recorded and put online, so we're very proud of that. Uh, follow us on Facebook. Friend us. We're very lonely. We feel like <laughs> we're insecure. We don't at least get to a thousand friends this year. I think we're at 899, so we really just need a few more. So friend us, please. We need you. We need you to like us. Let me get to the main event today. I'm really excited about this. So we wanted to start the fall the right way, and I think we've, I think we've done it. Uh, I could spend the entire hour of this session just introducing Elaine Horowitz because there's so much. I don't have. Should I do <laughs> So I've known Elaine for 35 years. <laughs> I've known Elaine for 35 years, but let me, I'll do a quick summary. We're, we're so happy today's Language Matters, our monthly series on language matters at the University of Texas is by Dr. Elaine Horowitz are internationally known, and I don't use that term lightly with very many of our faculty, but she is an internationally known expert on language teaching methodology, second language acquisition, language testing, and second language research methods. She's also well known for her research on language anxiety, which is going to have a nice tie into today's talk, and student and teacher beliefs about language learning, in addition to her numerous scholarly articles, and again, I could read her CV, and it would read like, a chronicle of some of the best SLA and foreign language teaching research in this country. But I wanted to point out specifically she's the co-editor with Dolly Young of Language Anxiety from Theory to Practice and Classroom Implications, as well as the seminal work of Horowitz, Horowitz and Cope. One of, if you've not Googled this on Google Scholar, it's got like 16 billion uh, <laughs> citations around the world. It's all over the place. Horowitz, Horowitz and Cope on Language Anxiety. Her assessment tool, the FLACUS for Language Classroom Anxiety Scale, and her beliefs and about language learning, uh, language learning inventory, the Valley, are both widely used instruments to help teachers and researchers better understand the needs of second language learners. Most recently, we're so proud of this here at UT and our 398T classes are especially pleased her uh, volume, Becoming a Language Teacher, Practical Guide to Second Language Learning and Teaching, uh, has bested Omagio Hadley for both the value for the buck as well as the content inside. And I'm all about a good deal that also is good reading and good in class. She's been an invited lecturer in so many countries I can't read them all and a consultant on improving language teaching throughout the world. Today she's going to talk to us about what we do outside of class, what our students can get out of, of language outside of class. Please help me welcome with a UT size welcome Dr. Elaine Horowitz. Mm -hmm. I 
want to tell you a little bit about the origin of this talk, and it's really not going to be a talk. I think it's going to, I'm hoping it's more of a, a discussion. And basically, I have something coming up, and I want you all to help me prepare for it. But um, Betsy noticed um, a couple weeks, a couple of months ago, that I was doing a presentation through UT informal classes, through the UT Odyssey program on learning a, a foreign, foreign language. So it's a talk about learning a foreign language to non-language people. Actually, the Odyssey people tend to be retired um, people. So there's this trend I hear that retired people are learning foreign languages now um, because it's always wonderful to learn a language and maybe it puts off Alzheimer's. So my colleague Ellen Bialystok in, in Canada is suggesting that. So, so, so why not? So I'm doing this, this lecture and Betsy said, why don't you come and do that same talk for us? And frankly, the talk is not appropriate um, exactly for this audience. Perhaps more importantly, the talk's not written or, 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 or done. You know, if I have to do it at the beginning of October, having it ready in the middle of September didn't seem like a good idea. Um, so I wanted to talk with you about some of the things that I'm thinking about in talking about language learning in an audience that is outside of the converted, the language teaching professionals. And I'm also hoping for, for your ideas um, in you know, helping me prepare for this, because I've got three more, more weeks. And you know, if you all give me 10, 15, 20 minutes, that, that, would, that would be good. <laughs> So what I have here are some slides from a talk that I did last spring for a church group in, in Austin. This, uh, this church was having a series of talks that they thought were vaguely scholarly, vaguely interesting. And, and frankly, most of the people who were invited were, were UT professors. Not entirely, but you know, UT professors were kind of um, invited to talk about their, their specialty. So the slides I'm going to show you today are the slides from that talk, which I view as kind of similar to the talk that, that I'm doing next month. The first thing that I learned about the talk that I gave in April, that I learned right away that was a mistake, was the title I gave to the talk. I don't have it on a slide, but the title that I used in the spring was How to Learn a Foreign Language, Why Age and Aptitude Matter Less Than You Think. So I imagine telling people that you can do it despite the fact that you're not a young child and despite the fact that you don't think you have some kind of magic abilities that some people have. But the problem with the title that I used in the spring was the phrase, how to learn a foreign language. And people came up, you see it right, right away, yeah, yeah. People came up to me afterwards and they said, oh, that was a really nice talk and you, you speak well and you tell good stories and I really liked it, but I was really hoping you'd tell us the magic secret sauce tricks for learning a language. Like we all know these special tricks and <laughs> we don't tell other people. We make them go to class, <laughs> we give them assignments, but we could tell them the special secret handshake key to learning a language. So it, I'm stuck with it now for the talk in October. I've tweaked the title a little bit. And instead of saying how to learn a foreign language, I made it learning 
a foreign language in the gut. You know? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, why age and aptitude uh, matter less than, than, you, than you think. So that's the title that I went to, went with. So what I did in the spring with, the, with this church group was, my goodness, hi, I didn't recognize you when, when you came, came in, um, was to do the top seven barriers to learning a foreign, a foreign language. Um, the, the nod to David Letterman, um, some of the, the younger people in the room can tell me, well, really, David Letterman, are you thinking that's going to be a good move to to talk to people outside the language teaching community and uh, counter with the Odyssey group is a group of kind of retired people. So I kind of think I'm okay with, 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 with Letterman. Okay. So the first issue I wanted to um, deal with with them. And, um, some of you um, may know that one of the things that, that I study in addition to foreign language anxiety is common beliefs that people have about language learning. And one of the beliefs that you encounter out of the world, I've encountered in some of my studies, is the idea that language learning is kind of an all or nothing thing that you either are fluent, and we'll leave that aside for a minute, or you're not. If you're fluent, you're you know, the one in five billion people who was successful. And if you're not fluent, like all the rest of us, then you haven't been successful. So what I, I did was have um, a discussion with them about, well, what do you mean by, by, by fluent? Um, like a native speaker, you couldn't be judged, you know, somebody couldn't pick you out in a room as a, as a non-native speaker. Are you maybe satisfied just being um, able to say everything you can in your, your first language? That would seem to be enough um, to me, but even that is probably too much to, to, to want. Are you simply um, talking about, without translating or thinking about it, some kind of automaticity when one talking without, you know, just trying to be the fastest translator on the face of, of the earth and, and you know, changing from one language to another in your head? Or could I make an argument to you that something less than all these, for your own needs, some more limited variety of the language, that is useful to you, that could accomplish something in the language, but you clearly not be taken as a, as a native speaker. You know, if we're saying just for your personal needs, it probably means that you can't do everything in the second language that you can do in the first. But probably we are talking about some kind of automaticity in doing it. So if we're talking about your needs, um, you know, what might your, your needs be? So I guess this would be a place that, that I, I'd ask for, for your input. Have you encountered people that have kind of other visions of, of what um, full language competence might, might be and what they're looking to accomplish? And if they're not accomplishing that, um, they're not being successful as, as, as language learners. Yes, ma'am. Say one thing, because my mother used herself as a complete failure in language learning, and she's uh, almost 70 years old. She's in the right Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And she started out as a French major in college and then couldn't achieve this and gave it up. Right? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. And yeah. she's really super hung up on pronunciation and accent. Yeah. And she always thinks that it was her southern accent yeah. that kept her from being a successful That's French right. major. 
you know, has nothing to do with like, you know, pragmatism no. or community no. competency. Yeah. Accent and that might be something that just to, people yeah, to specifically like a native speaker, yeah, but the, the, the kind of the, the the piece of like a native speaker is is the is the accent piece that people do get get on that one. Yes. I, uh, my students worry about this all the time, and I say it, it doesn't matter that if if a if an exchange student here at UT goes to the co-op over there and says to the clerk, "How much will be costing these book?" What is the clerk? Is the clerk correct the language? No. The clerk says twenty-two ninety-five. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and what kind of and what, what kind of system? person would we think that clerk was if the clerk would? Oh, you really well, told you how, how funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's also yeah. someone like Henry Kissinger, who <laughs> incredibly bright, okay. incredible speaker, yeah. heavy accent. Heavy accent. Mm -hmm. And maybe, though, there are some accents that, you know, some cultural groups, Americans, view favorably German and a diplomat, Southern and a French major, and maybe, maybe not. I just wanted to say that um, the exchange student, it doesn't matter for the clerk in, at the co-op, but it matters for the professor that that person is working with. I mean, they can't even get into the program with the students of UT. And they need academic English to set up fluency. It's about some dimension of English that they need that isn't, you know, isn't sufficient. It's the four year needs part. Three if needs they're part. trying to pass an exam to get into the university and have a certain English level, that's a different, that's a different that's scenario. That's a different need for me. That's the four year needs yeah. part that makes it Is this the appropriate time to also add to the huge. time dimension? The time to dimension, yeah. Yes. Um, the, yeah, there's a non realistic perception of, of, time. of time. I think there was this news story about a year ago about a young man who was diagnosed on the autism spectrum and the news story said that you know every three or four weeks he learned a new new language and, you know that, that becomes difficult for, for us we don't know what it means to say that he learned a new language but the news media thinks it's you know oh of course yeah we'll just put that on on, on tv Wait, can I say one more story yeah My, michael katz we used to. I know Michael. We, 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 Tom knows really Michael, Michael, but Katz. I don't know. Michael Katz said, People ask me all the time, Am I fluent in Russian? And he'd say, Well, I'm fluent in Russian 501 and 502. <laughs> <laughs> like a native speaker or everything you can do in the L1 and the L2, we've got to wait a lot, lot of years, can't, you know, you know, isn't it cool right now to talk about sub goals and, you know, rewarding yourself for, for particular um, accomplishments along, along the way. Um, some years ago, um, I heard a, a sociolinguist named Susan Irvin Tripp um, talk about, about language learning. I know Tom, you you probably and um, in you know in the the eighties, she was kind of the name in in sociolinguistics, and she was invited to a language teaching conference, and she she listened to some of the the talks, and then. I don't know, she was responding or something. And she got up there and she was like really puzzled. And she said, why on earth would you want to have a native-like accent in another language? If you have a native-like accent, people will think that you belong in that group. And then when you inevitably do things inappropriately in the culture, They'll think that you're stupid or rude or psychopathic or you know any one of a very large number of 
possible, you know, bad adjectives. But if you have an accent, you mark yourself as a foreigner, and you say, oh, well, that person's just a foreigner. Of course, we excuse them for their behavior. And, and you know, who among us would, you know, approve bad behavior towards, towards foreigners? So the first thing we talked about was what does it mean to learn a language? And the next thing is, is Vince's issue. It should take about two years to learn a new language, right? We all, we all know that. Uh, UT, until recently, had a two-year foreign language requirement. Why would we have a two-year foreign language requirement if that wasn't the amount of time it took to, 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 to learn a language? Um, right? Um, aside, I just sent around to the LESA list, which is a student list in foreign language education. Um, this Friday at 4 o'clock at uh, Lanton Elementary School, which I'm not quite sure where, where exactly it is, but it, it's in Austin. Um, Virginia Collier and um, her colleague Thomas, and I forget his first name. Okay, uh, not 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 some people's favorite scholars, but um, but um, Kyer and and Thomas are are usually the ones who are quoted as saying that in order for academic language to develop in students, it takes around four to six years, and they're going to be in Austin on on Friday in the cafeteria at Blanton elementary school. So I, I think that is exciting and kind of uh, appropriate to, to this topic. Can I say two yes. things that I think will be find of interest? The first thing is, as I said, so many people here interested in language, maybe some of you can help me with the source of this content. In 1978, while driving to North Pole Junior High School in Fairbanks, Alaska area, on NPR, first year Spanish teacher, I heard uh, report on the radio, and it said that every word that we have, like the word enthusiastic, that before it became our word, that you had to have a certain number of repetitions before it naturally came out of your mouth. And that was what the report was about. And they, the statistic they said was 10,000 repetitions. And that can be looking at it, thinking and seeing it, writing, not just pronouncing it, but any time you have contact with that word. Your parents say, you hear it on TV, watch a sign. So when I used to work with my kids and they wanted to say shoo, 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 shoo to try to remember that word, it was like, you know, that's not word. But So that's one thing. If anybody ever has heard of any statistic about how many repetitions it takes to... And, and, and my point is almost like that sounds a little nippy to, to me. Like where did you mean? Yeah, 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 where, where does, yeah, where does, does, where like, does, where does that, that, that that's what I want to Yeah, know. yeah, yeah. So there was one other thing. So when I used to, um, when I was a high school teacher, I would go and talk to kids that didn't want to be in foreign language classes and try to motivate them to try to be excited about their foreign language class. And we talked about this exact fact about children, what fluency is, and about speaking the language well. And I would give them an example about what superior English sounded like. And they would sit there and I'd say, do you speak English really well? Do you feel like you're a superior speaker of English? And I said, how many of you would say something like this? And I used to say, um, oh, if I had the money, Last week, I would have given it to you, but I will have it by next Thursday, so I'll give it to you. And they would all go, ugh. <laughs> we never talk. <laughs> so the whole idea of proficiency and fluency is, so, is yeah. So we, we can't probably talk about this without talking about the, the previous slide. But um, I thought I had, um, I thought I had corrected that first statement, but I obviously um, didn't correct it. What that should say is how many hours of exposure does it take before a child can speak their first language? And I, I, I corrected it, but, but um, so, I mean, when you start thinking about, you know, two years of, of study, even two years 
of immersion in kindergarten and first grade and the number of hours that a child has, has spent um, being exposed doing various things in their first language, it's really um, a bad comparison. Um, when I took first language acquisition courses all those years ago, the, the gospel that was quoted was that first language acquisition was still going on in, um, at around the age of 14 in, in middle school and early, early high school. Um, I would even say that's, that's even longer. Those of you who are in, in graduate school now, uh, you know, one of the purposes of graduate school is to make you sound like us. And when you sound enough like us, we, 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 we let you put uh, Orlando. I don't mean to leave anybody else out, but uh, when you sound enough like us, we, we, we let you go and we give you a, a, a degree. So um, there's certainly language acquisition, maybe it's specialized language acquisition that, that goes on well into um, the double digit years. Um, it depends on what you mean by learn. There's always somebody in some crowd who wants to, you know, argue definitions with with you. So, you know, we can go back to the previous slide of, you know, what is the the outcome. Um, I had I, I talked about this poor young man last week in class, and I'm bringing him up again. I had uh, a second year French student years ago who had spent actually a fair amount of time in, in France, but somehow only tested into second year. And he would come to me after class and say things like, well, I speak French really well. I don't know what's wrong with the French people that they, <laughs> that they don't under, understand me. Obviously, there's some kind of societal failing <laughs> over there because I, I, I mastered it. Um, what other skill can you learn in, in, two, in two years? I mean, one wouldn't take up Olympic running, one wouldn't take up a musical instrument and say, I'm going to be really accomplished in two years. But somehow, two years is enough uh, for, 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 for language learning. Uh, I was thinking also of the analogy of taking up an instrument. I would say that most people, and I've never done an instrument, I, uh, I claim zero, zero, zero musical aptitude, affinity, anything like that, but my guess is that most people who take up an instrument don't say Carnegie Hall or I fail. <laughs> I mean, some people, some people do. But most people take up an instrument for pleasure, to be able to, you know, hang out with groups in high school and, you know, have some musical background. They may, you know, keep it up for, for parts of their life. But, but I think most people, you know, my, my son play, plays the cello and he takes it out from time to time and often he says, I wish I played better. But he doesn't look at the cello and say, I'm a failure at the cello because, you know, I've, um, I've never made a college orchestra, which was his goal, but didn't quite, quite do that.
kind of Asia, uh, Korea, Japan, ta Taiwan. And Americans tend to attribute success to aptitude, whereas some of the Asian populations are more likely to attribute success to work and time. So, uh, I, I wasn't planning to say this, but I mean, I don't think it's unusual for an American child to come home from, from high school and got a C in high school Spanish and the parent to say, well, that's okay, honey, we don't have Spanish aptitude, we don't have foreign language aptitude in, in, our, in, our, in our family, rather than saying, well, let's work harder on it. If you put in more time and effort, I bet that you can you can do you can do better. Okay, there is a lot of yeah. I see. I did some edits on this, and they didn't come 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 through here. Uh, the idea that there is a critical period for language learning. Um, generally associated with uh, Eric Lenneberg's paper in the 60s, and the critical period, meaning that there's some door opening and closing for language learning ability happens uh, around um, puberty. Uh, I edited it because this was going to be a language audience to, to, the, to the lay people I wrote, there is very little data. I think I, I tried, I don't remember what phrase that I had decided for from your, for your sophisticated eyes, but I was trying to be a little bit more, more, cape, more careful. So I think I, I meant to write there is not strong evidence, you know, for that, that. That's what I was going to use here with you all, rather than what I was going to use with with the lay office and lay audience. And if you think I was fudging a little bit, that's that that's that's fair. But the idea um, that I don't know. I always say that language learning is magical when you. you spread some fairy dust over children and and they're they're bilingual that that's that's a real strong belief I think that that we have out out there um, and I've seen enough children crying on on playgrounds um, I'm persuaded a fair amount by Collier and Thomas's uh, research on the number of, of years that it takes to get really good language, um, that it's not, you know, maybe it's a little easier for children, but it's not the fairy dust uh, picnic that, that people tend to think. And the consequence is that when you're older, certainly when you're retired, um, that ship has sailed. You're, you're not going to be a, a kid again. So if you believe that there was this time when you would have, could have, and you missed it, that's that's not that's not uh, helpful. Um, one thing I, I I try to tell people that there are three reasons why the research is not as clear as they think it is that in um, most studies, it's difficult to control for the number of years somebody who had, somebody has spent learning the language and the age they were when they started learning. So if somebody started at four and you test their language at 20, well, they've had 16 years in between. If somebody got here at 18 and you test their language at 20, yes, they started at 18, not, a, not the ideal age according to the critical period um, idea, but they've only had two years to, to learn a language and it doesn't seem fair to, to point that out. Another way of thinking of that is what, what I call the, the apples versus oranges issue. 
in order for us to judge a four-year-old as completely competent in any language, they only have to speak the language of a four-year-old. Mm -hmm. For for you know, for us, we have to speak the language of our peer group, you know, graduate school varieties in, included. So there's just a, a lot more to um, to learn. And the the unreliable observer, um, I just made up this anecdote, so I don't know whether it's fair or, or not, but it's not beyond me to make up unfair and anecdotes. <laughs> but, but you hear things like, um, my family and I were stationed in, in Germany for four years, and um, we came home from Germany, and I don't speak any German, and my wife doesn't speak any German, but Billy speaks fluent German. Well, the person who just told you that Billy speaks fluent German also told you that he didn't speak any German <laughs> at, at all. So he doesn't seem to me to be maybe the, the best judge of Billy's German. I, I'm, I'm sure that Billy spe probably speaks the best German of his family, seems to be you know, really great at German compared to the other folks. But we just have, you know, let's have actual use non-speakers of, 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 as, of, of as, as raiders. Certainly, <laughs> certainly that. <laughs> that there are some sort of special abilities, aptitudes. Some folks have it. Some folks don't have it. Um, this is, I think, a little bit related to the children and fairy dust idea that if you have aptitude, you know, a couple afternoons with a dictionary and you, 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 should, be, you should be fine, but if you, you don't. Um, I talked to the church group a little bit about the history of aptitude testing. Um, Andreana and Christina just going to earlier today in, in, in class the, this, this, this morning. But the aptitude testing comes out of the American military. And the goal of the aptitude tests were not to identify who could and who could not learn a language. The goal of the aptitude test is to identify who could learn a language more quickly in intensive settings, in, you know, in Professor Garza's intensive Russian that, you know, he's spent all, all morning, that it seems like there may be some people who are better suited to those kinds of intensive language learning experiences. But the idea that there is, you know, a language learning gene so far, although there's there's an article I haven't read on the last actual newsletter that says something about a language learning gene being discovered. But when I clicked on it for a second, it only had to do with word learning. I, 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 I think so. When, Okay, I feel better. Okay. Uh, research on the relationship of IQ and language achievement shows only a very small correlation under 0.2, um, closer to, to 0.1. Aptitude testing has historically looked for these three abilities, phonetic encoding, which probably means the ability to associate sounds with letters, grammatical sensitivity, which probably means something like um, having a sense of how sentences are put together and what goes where, and uh, rote memory for vocabulary. And I think most of us in this room would say, huh, that's a pretty 
incomplete list of the things that people need to do in order to, to learn a language. It's kind of it's kind of simplified. It's kind of almost uh, naive and 1940-ish, which is exactly when those tests were uh, originally uh, developed. So I think you know, most of us would say, yeah, there's, there's lots more that people need to do to, to learn a second language. And the highest predictor, if you look at all the, the, the studies, I've had people say to me that anxiety is the highest predictor, but that's that's not true. The highest predictor of achievement in a second language by, by a lot as I read the studies is motiv motivation. And that makes sense because we go back a few slides and we talked about how long it takes to, to learn a language. Um, you know, probably motivation um, equals some variation of time on task and time on task you know, gives you some some variation on, on achievement. Yes? Is there, is there a check um, number? Is intrinsic or extrinsic motivation is one more closely correlated to the other? Um, I, I would, it would clearly have to be intrinsic. Um, that's, a, that's a dichotomy that's not used a lot in language studies, but extrinsic um, motivation would refer to some kind of reward for, for language learning and those of us who have been associated with the language requirement here at UT um, might, might feel that um, there's, well, we require them to take it, you know, we give them the Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about love? Love, love, love yeah. would be love would be intrinsic. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. Yeah. I must be an academic. I'm classifying love according, <laughs> according to motivational categories. Yes, ma'am. Just by chance, I've been reading a lot about this very thing recently about motivation, and there's a TED talk about motivation in the world of business and all the research, all the research about motivation shows that if you give people rewards, they don't do as well. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable when you read it. Yeah. It's, it's the, it's the, it has to come from inside. You give them a banana or an apple or candy or whatever, it doesn't matter. Usually do worse. And there's some research that if you give them a reward, they do it for a while. If you reward them for something that they were originally intrinsically motivated to do, and then you take away the reward, they stop doing it, even though they were originally intrinsically motivated to do it. Sounds really good. To do it. Okay. What do you have to do to learn a language? And I think we could get people who endorse any of these. The most important part of learning a language is learning the grammar, learning the vocabulary, learning to translate. And if you believe that, that's probably what you do. And if you spend a lot of time memorizing words and then you don't end up speaking the language very well, because you know, us sophisticated people know that memorizing words is not what um, you sh you're supposed to be doing, then you start thinking like, well, I don't have aptitude for language. I've memorized 5,000 words and I can't speak it yet, so there must be something wrong with, with, with me. So my favorite image is the vitamin deficient diet image that um, that we have to do lots of things to learn a lang language. And probably, given our goals, and given the language, and given whatever, maybe we do different things. But, but at some point, somebody is going to ask me, uh, you all are language people, so you haven't um, asked me. But at some point, somebody in the church group, and somebody in this room, 
retirement group is going to say, what about Rosetta Stone? <laughs> and I, I have a joke that goes with Rosetta Stone. I usually go, I like Rosetta Stone. I think it's definitely worth $39.95. And they go, you know, it's a lot more expensive than that. And I go, yeah, I'll so that's, 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 that's my Rosetta Stone. But, but that maybe Rosetta Stone is part of the diet for some people or something like Ro Rosetta Stone. But the idea that any computer program, the idea of any one experience leading you to good fluency in, in life, these are really controversial things that, you, that you're going to be putting up on. on. Online is is can we delete the Rosetta Stone? I think they're going to sue me. I, I, I heard that they're very. I won't say anything more about that. <laughs> what did you hear? <laughs> but you know what is amazing about Rosetta Stone is they become so popular. Yeah, I mean they're making it. It's a great business model because yeah. people are so desperate to learn languages. So yeah. they're smart. They're smart. Commercials recently for something called Babel, which I which I haven't which I haven't seen, but I I've seen a few few commercials for 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 yeah. So I think the, the question that I want to leave people with is more: What do successful language learners do versus what? abilities do successful language learners have. And we're, we're getting close to the end, so... Okay, so I had this thing. It had its own slide. I for, I forgot. Well, um, there, the commercial does say, there's a, a woman on one of their commercials that says, Compared to being dropped in the country, left to your own devices, <laughs> it's fun. Rosetta Stone is the best way to, to learn a language. And, and you know, why did you want to put that in a commercial? I don't know, but that's what their commercial says. I've listened, I've listened to it re repeatedly. So I don't usually talk about Rosetta Stone, but if you're talking to an outside language audience, uh, Rosetta Stone is, is, is going to come up. And the idea that, you know, it's, it's probably one thing that will give you some about amount of language ability, but it can't be the only thing that, that you do. And then, um, I make them listen to my ideas about uh, foreign language anxiety. I think a, a good uh, number of people in the room have, have heard me um, talk about my mother and, and clothing that she liked to have me wear. And uh, I, won't, I won't do the whole thing so we can have a couple of minutes for, for discussion, but the idea is that some people, when speaking another language, um, don't feel like themselves. They feel uncomfortable because they can't show themselves as intelligent, as warm, as empathic, as whatever adjectives, whatever parts of their personality are really important to them. And most people, and most people are not foreign language anxious in terms of the studies that I've done. Two thirds of people don't seem to be. Most people are, well sure I can't be myself, show exactly who I am. It's a foreign language. I'm a learner, duh. You know, of course I can't quite be as sophisticated or whatever in the, in the second language. But some people, feel that the second language is a barrier, a mask, some kind of hindrance between them and the people that they're meeting in the language and they feel that makes sense. I always tell my students there's nothing more liberating than that mask. <laughs> <laughs> now she's 
chance. Now's your chance. Now's your chance. Yeah, yeah. And I, and certainly uh, I've heard the 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 other side of it. It's like, oh, I don't have to worry about all those other things. I can just you know start over. You know what what whatever you know. People all the time. Perhaps women more than men get new hairstyles, get new glasses, get new makeup, and say, okay, I'm going to reinvent myself for a, a little. And I think that's where I left off. Are there other barriers that I should put on that, that list? I'm just curious, do you think that these uh, barriers are, are universal, like across the globe? Because I definitely think that like uh, Europeans, for example, don't see the time the time amount the same way that Americans do. Yeah. Um, I don't, I can't really answer your question. The first way I'd answer your question is we've done studies with college-age language learners in a number of countries and their beliefs seem to coincide. On the other hand, by no means do I have any kind of representative all over the world kind of. I mean, it seems to me that Europe is a good example of you know, people looking around and saying, well, I know a lot of people who speak other, other languages, so if they can do it, I can do it. It's not so unusual. Here, you know, it's hard to find um, somebody who speaks another language, and sometimes the attribution is that that person must be weird. Yeah. In my first school, my first teaching job, I was in, um, uh, it was a junior high at the time, now would be a, a middle school, and people start coming up to me and saying things like, you're not like a normal French teacher. And on the one hand, I thought that was nice. On the other hand, it, it didn't feel good. It felt like they were insulting my colleagues. You know, that, you know, if you're a French teacher, you're, you're supposed to be, if you're a foreign language teacher, if you're a foreign language speaker, you're supposed to be a little bit not typical, not not regular. Foreign. Foreign. <laughs> you could probably speak even, even more to this only than, than I can, but another barrier would possibly be what's this, what students think the foreign language classroom should be. Should be, exactly. Exactly. And there is a belief, I think, that we encounter often, which is, I didn't learn the language, or I did learn the language because I had a good teacher or because I had a bad teacher. That there's some magic in the teacher that you were assigned to. And there are clear categories of good and bad language teachers. And you learn with good teachers and you don't learn with, with bad teachers. And everybody would look at the same teacher and come up with the same teacher. Any other comments, questions, additions, top 12 reasons? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to add one more thing. Please, please. Back, obviously. Um, so, have you all heard about the um, UT mindset for incoming freshmen? Have you read anything about it? Well, our article in the New York Times, who gets to graduate, okay, go Google, who gets to graduate, New York Times Magazine, 12th of June, there was an article, and it talks about some research going on right here on campus, as well as across the United States. And as I read it, it basically talks about two intrinsic motivations that young students whose families have never had anyone, you know, first generation university students, that they lack. And one is um, the intrinsic motivation of belonging, of sick, like you ought to be here. And the other one is the value of, oh, your brain actually can grow when I can learn this. Mm -hmm. And they just lacking those two things. But the article, it has changed my whole life. I wrote a fan letter to these guys. <laughs> somewhere. I haven't heard from them yet. I'm ready to be the person of the fan club. But as I read it, I completely thought about the mindset of learning a foreign language yeah. is the same thing. I've had so many years of this language, I can't speak a word of it. Honey, you're in Spanish, you're going to do poorly, it's okay, yeah. you do well in math. Yeah. Read 
the article. It's wonderful, right? And it is true that in the U.S., not doing well in a language does not really cut off so many life paths for for, for, for yeah. yeah 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 you're, you're normal you know. Yeah. Was there another thing you said you were going to? Were there two things you said? No, just that. Well, okay. I think sure, maybe sure. Yeah, I'm just going to say a barrier is um, the perfectionistic person yes. versus yes. the risk taker. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That you, you've got to develop tolerance for, I mean, what is this idea that everything that comes out of your, your mouth has to be correct? It's a foreign language. When children don't say things right, we don't say, you know, make your mouth more like that. <laughs> we say, come here. Do that. Do that. <laughs> well, let's just say I did. There you do that. No, you have the pink dresses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we are, we're approaching the witching hour, and I, I wanted to end with, with one final little anecdote. Well, I could so many around Elaine Horowitz, Wilbur Rivers, and company and all, but. Um, we I, share I, Wilker with we Rivers. We share, we share with, with one of the best memories ever. Um, I, I teach a 350 person undergraduate of these UGS courses and all the kind of unwashed masses of our, under, of our freshmen who come in with all kinds of backgrounds, mostly a lot of animus toward us in the humanities because there are a lot of engineers in this group and so forth. And one of the last questions that they get, they get a questionnaire at the end of the course about what did you do, what did you write, who did you meet, what, what have you done for first year students? And one of the questions is, what university gems have you discovered during your first year at the University of Texas? And you usually get things like the HRC, I saw the Gutenberg Bible, Jane Fonda's dress, these kind of things that they, they list as our university. The Longhorns, a lot of, there are a lot of cows. <laughs> I've never seen a person on this list, among all the people we've got. And this past year I taught this group, and one of them, a very thoughtful student who wrote quite a bit about University Gems and said, and one more gem, I took a course at the College of Education, and I have to list Elaine Horowitz as a university gem. <laughs> I want to go to thank me for starting our sixth year at the Texas Language Center with a gem of the university <laughs> and a gem of the language teacher to thank Dr. Elaine Horowitz for today's talk. October will appreciate all the, the suggestions <laughs> and contributions. But I promise to um, do a good job and not embarrass you. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you all so much for making the startup of the new academic